Hey guys, I'm Georgia and welcome back for another episode of my Unsolved Mystery series where today we're mixing Unsolved with a sprinkling of history as well. Today we're going to be talking about the 1944 Hartford Circus fire in Connecticut in which the big tent went up in flames resulting in the injuries of 682 people and the deaths of 167. Some sources will quote 168 victims, apparently there was confusion with collection of remains from the site and an additional victim might have been incorrectly tallied, but we think it is 167. But where does the mystery portion come into this? Well to this day we still don't know who or what really caused the fire and five or six victims remain unidentified to this day, with investigation currently underway to reunite them with their identities and their families. This is classed as one of the worst disasters, one of the most avoidable disasters in United States history and in fact some do quote the number of dead as being much much higher. Over the coming years, many more people who have been present at the circus that day would die. The effects of smoke inhalation or just the trauma of the whole thing taking over. But let's start at the very beginning. On the 6th of July 1944 in Hartford, Connecticut, so 78 years ago. In this time, circuses were a huge source of entertainment for people all across America, or actually all across the world. The biggest travelling circus in the USA at this time was the Ringling Bros and Barnum and Bailey Circus. And if you've ever seen The Greatest Showman, and let's face it, who hasn't at this point, you will recognise the Barnum name. From 1919, Barnum and Bailey merged with the Ringling Bros and created somewhat of this mega circus. And this was the 1900s as well. This was the classic circus with all the animal acts as well as humans lion and tiger taming, elephants, camels and more. In a world in which they didn't have access to the internet and where travel to other countries to see animals like this wasn't exactly feasible for the vast majority of people, people would have travelled pretty far to attend the circus to see them. It was always this big spectacular, this big day out. And I mean big. The big top tent alone could see up to 9,000 spectators. It had three separate rings and was 200 feet wide by 450 feet long. The roof itself was 48 feet high. It was this massive canvas tent transported from town to town by train along with 700 employees who ran the show and that's not including the performers. This was a big operation. You had truck drivers, canvas men, seat men, rigging men, elephant men, ticket takers, ushers and more. So many employees. But in 1944, the circus had actually been struggling with a shortage of personnel to work it thanks to World War II. Both men and equipment were pulled away from the circus to help with the war, obviously. So in the past couple of years, the usually smooth running circus had been struck with all manner of malfunctions and delays. So much so that on the 5th of July, so the day before the disaster, the trains carrying the circus actually turned up late to Hartford, meaning that the afternoon show had to be cancelled. There's apparently a long-standing circus superstition that says missing a show is considered to be extremely bad luck. So for that evening show, which did go ahead, all the employees were on high alert, sort of half expecting something to go terribly wrong. And when it didn't, they relaxed. However, it would be the next day that the superstition would ring true, during the 2.15pm afternoon performance on the 6th of July. Now, of course, this was 1944. They didn't have computers and little phone zappy things to scan ticket barcodes and count each person as they entered the big top that day. People just showed their tickets and entered, meaning that no one has ever been able to say for certain just how many people attended the circus that day. Estimates sit at around 7,000 people. They do know the Big Top certainly wasn't full to the brim, but it was busy. And sadly, the audience consisted that day of mostly children. I mean, most of the men were away at war, women were working in the factory, so whatever adults were available just gathered up the children and took them to the circus, this big once a year event. A later eyewitness report by Jack Mayer, who was just six years old at the time of the circus, said that he was very excited that day to find out his dad was going to take him to his first ever circus. They entered the big tent and found their seats in the bleachers to the left of the entrance. The show started that day without a hitch. Jack remembered a clown car driving to the centre ring and 20 or so clowns getting out, a circus classic. The next act was lions and tigers in their cages that he remembered starting to leave the tent in these big four-wheeled cages that were pulled off the centre ring. 
Then the high wire act started, with acrobats climbing to their perches high in the tent, men and women balancing on a steel cable. This act was called the Great Wellenders. They were a group of daredevil stunt performers who performed high wire acts without a safety net. However, as the act got underway, Jack noticed something out of the corner of his eye, something orange and yellow circling the main entrance of the tent. At first he thought this was a part of the act, but quickly realised it was a fire. The first circus employee to notice the fire was apparently the circus band leader, Mel Evans, who immediately directed the band to play The Stars and Stripes Forever, a song that traditionally signalled distress to all circus performers. At this point, the fire was perhaps five or six feet in height. It was a pretty big fire if you came across it in your own home, but it was still small enough that it could have been put out by a conventional fire extinguisher, had there been one on hand. But of course, there wasn't. The circus did have fire extinguishers. They had some two and a half to three gallon ones and about 30 smaller ones as well, but they'd never been unpacked from the train cars. Had these extinguishers been distributed around the circus tent in strategic locations like they were supposed to be, then maybe the fire would have been able to be controlled early on. But that was not to be the case. From this point onwards, the fire spread incredibly quickly across the canvas tent. Now canvas in itself isn't a hugely flammable fabric. It will burn, but its natural fibres are much more resistant to burning than a lot of others. However, canvas isn't naturally waterproof, which is kind of a recipe for disaster when you're using it to shield people from the elements. So the big top canvas we treated to make it waterproof, and this particular tent had last been treated in the May, so just three months earlier. Workers boiled a mixture of four parts Texaco white gasoline and one part yellow paraffin wax, and then this was applied to the roof canvas with watering cans and brooms, but importantly, it wasn't applied to the side walls. At this time, this method of waterproofing was generally thought to be safe, as gasoline would have evaporated after a few days, but I don't think it really would have helped things. Gasoline is incredibly flammable. I mean, you're literally not allowed to smoke at petrol stations for this exact reason. Never ever put a fire near petrol or gasoline. But there's never been a clear answer as to whether or not this did worsen the fire that day. After later investigation, it was found by the state fire marshal, Edward J. Hickey, who also just happened to be at the circus that day, that the fire had originated in the southwest corner of the main tent, either at the back of the blue bleachers on which people sat, or in the men's toilet behind. The flames then caught onto the wall of canvas that separated the main tent and the men's toilet, and from there it just thrived. The theory at the time, and for many even now, is that the fire was caused by a carelessly discarded cigarette, but there's never been anything to prove that for sure. It's thought that the fire may have started closer to the ground on the side canvas, but it travelled up a prop holding the canvas ceiling up, and that's when the true extent of the fire was to become clear. Once the fire reached the ceiling, it started to burn incredibly quickly, which does suggest maybe the gasoline did have something to do with it, and pieces of canvas would fall onto people below, burning on fire pieces of canvas. As ushers and other circus employees rushed towards the fire with buckets of water, which obviously did nothing to help, circus goers had to find routes out. Now the fire had started next to the main entrance, so that was a no-go, it was completely engulfed by flames by this point, but there was other exits. There was another kind of main exit towards the west side of the tent, and those with higher anxiety who saw the fire and immediately panicked, were able to safely leave before things got too out of control, rushing across the tent to the exit. However, way too many people didn't react quickly. A lot of people would later report thinking that the flames were part of the act, just sitting and watching the scene unfold in front of them, and other people who did realise the fire was legitimate just assumed the circus workers would quickly get the flames under control and the show would continue. All of this happened in a matter of just a couple of minutes, maybe even seconds, but those who were quick to react managed to leave unscathed. When the masses did realise what was going on, this mass panic occurred and everyone rushed at once towards the exit on the south side of the tent. Only then you had thousands of people trying to squeeze through only a couple of small gaps in the canvas, about five feet wide. It was a herd of people panicking, running, screaming, trying to escape. As people scrambled away, chairs and other items were discarded in the walkways down from the bleachers, 
causing people to trip and fall, and then people tripped and fell over those people. It was pandemonium. Those who were able to squeezed under the side walls of the tent, but not everyone was able to fit, and lots of people didn't even realise that was an option in the panic. Also, there's 7,000 people here, there's only so much canvas to crawl under. The exit closest to those who were trapped nearest the fire was completely blocked off by animal cages. The animal acts were performed in what they called performance cages on the main ring and then the big cats were herded through chutes that led from the performance cage to several cage wagons to transport them back to their holding area. This collection of cages and chutes made it incredibly difficult to access this exit. You had to climb over the chutes which was not an easy feat considering the audience was mostly young children with their mothers in heels holding babies. It was later reported that 60 bodies we found squeezed up against these shoes. It was absolute chaos. Parents were literally throwing their children towards the exits, squeezing them underneath the canvas knowing they themselves weren't going to fit. Lots of people just lost their minds in the panic. Separated from their loved ones, they just ran around the tent in circles screaming their names instead of actively trying to escape. Others escaped and then ran back inside looking for their children. You never know how you personally are going to react in a situation like this. You think you'll do the smart thing. You always think you're going to do the smart thing. But in that moment of pure panic, you don't know what you're going to do. And it breaks my heart thinking of all these parents and children just separated and just wanting to be together and dying. The band remained on the stage playing for as long as they could, trying to calm the panicked audience. But soon the main pole holding up the roof started to sway and bend, a big gust of wind causing the flames to move even faster. So the band ducked out of the closest exit as this pole came down, trapping hundreds of people underneath this blanket of burning canvas and paraffin. All of this happened in less than 10 minutes, most sources say just 8 minutes. By the time firefighters arrived, the tent had already collapsed and they knew it wasn't a case of rescuing people. This was going to be a case of recovering the bodies and putting the fire out. In the end, nearly 170 people had died. Now you would assume that most of these would have died as a direct result of the flames, but many had also fallen victim to smoke inhalation or just been trampled to death. And I really struggled to even think about that last one. The local hospital, Municipal Hospital, got its first call about the incoming emergency at 2.45pm and 10 minutes later casualties started arriving. In the next 80 minutes, 143 patients were admitted, 5 of those were dead on arrival and 6 others would die within an hour. However, this was a very small hospital and simply wasn't equipped to deal with the tragedy of this size, although they did try their best. In total, 682 people were injured, but not all of these required hospital treatment. It took just an hour and a half to remove all the bodies from the fire site. On site in Hartford, the State Police Commissioner and Fire Marshal, the aforementioned Edward Hickey, immediately set up a temporary casualty station, where the dead were taken until the State Medical Examiner authorised the removal of the deceased to the local armoury. As the bodies started to arrive at the armoury, casualty tags featuring four digit numbers were attached to each one. They were then placed on cots, covered with blankets, and then thoroughly examined by medical professionals. Notes were kept for each and every body, featuring approximate age, height, weight, sex, build, hair colour, scars, dental work, and any clothing or jewellery found with the body. These bodies were all really badly burnt. They knew that going forward, identification was going to be one of their biggest hurdles. This was 1944. They couldn't rely on DNA testing or anything like that. They had to pay careful attention to the details of each victim and try and match them to the people searching for them. Fingerprinting was also no help in the majority of cases because the fingers, the fingerprints, were often destroyed by the fire. Very soon, survivors of the fire and people whose loved ones just hadn't come back home queued up outside the armoury, hoping with everything that their loved ones weren't inside. These people were allowed to begin entering at 5pm, so literally just two hours, two and a half hours after the fire had started. They were taken in groups of 12 to view the bodies, assisted by a state trooper and a nurse. The disaster response here was actually really, really good. They got all their ducks in a row very quickly in the face of such a tragedy. And upon entering the armoury, the bodies were sorted into groups by age and sex. So loved ones were taken only to the relevant areas to look for the bodies. 
However, like I said, these were victims of fire. Most of the bodies were burned beyond recognition. Their faces were destroyed, so people had to rely on other small tales to identify them. Many people had to come back multiple times before they were able to confirm the identity of a body. Imagine how difficult that is. I'm sure a lot of our worst fears are having to identify the body of a loved one, but imagine having to do it in conditions like this, having to look at multiple bodies all destroyed, hoping that the next blanket lifted doesn't reveal a familiar face. You'd have nightmares for the rest of your life. Once identifications were positively made, they had to be cleared by the medical examiner who would then sign the death certificates. In the end, nearly one third of the victims would have to be identified via their dental charts. But a number of people remained unidentified, the most well known of which was a young girl who came to be known as Little Miss 1565, the number after the identification tag put on her body when she entered the armoury. I just can't understand how this little girl remained unidentified, how no one came looking for her. It's very, very unlikely that she would have entered the big top alone that day, so somebody must have been with her. She probably would have been from the local area, even if she was alone that day, she would have had family locally. How can no one notice she was missing? The story around Little Miss's identity is confusing, as many sources will state that she was identified back in 1991. But as you'll come to see, plenty of people do debate the validity of this identification. Little Miss 1565 was a young blonde girl wearing a white dress, and considering the disaster she had found herself in, her face remained very identifiable with only a few burns. Her cause of death was asphyxiation. If you do want to see a photo of her face post-mortem, you can just Google her dome moniker, Little Miss 1565. She was said to be about 6 years old, 3 foot 10, and only had two permanent teeth. As more and more victims started to get claimed by their loved ones, Little Miss remained unclaimed and unidentified. It was unbelievable to the authorities working the case, and it's said that two Hartford police sergeants became obsessed with finding her identity. They took dental impressions, fingerprints, footprints and photographs. The dental charts were sent to hundreds of dentists in the area in the hope they might be able to match them to a patient. But the problem with dental charts and children around this age is their teeth are falling out, left, right and centre. The teeth and mouth are changing constantly, so this didn't really bring anything up. As well as this, they questioned mailmen, doctors, tradesmen, Sunday school teachers, anyone who had close contact with a lot of the local community, especially children, and might recognise her, or at least know of a family missing a child. They tried to match her to adult victims of the fire as well, maybe it was just her and a parent out there all alone and that parent had died, but they failed in that respect too. However, there are still remaining unidentified adults of this tragedy, so some do wonder if she was maybe the daughter of one of them. Anyone who claimed a body on the night of the fire was shown a photo of this young girl. They visited orphanages and welfare agencies and wrote to every single primary school in Connecticut. But eventually, she was buried without a name in Hartford Northwood Cemetery, where a memorial to all the victims would later be erected. For a very long time, there were no clues as to her identity, until 1981, when the now widow of one of the late sergeants on this case said that her husband had indeed found out the identity of the girl and had told her family, but they didn't want any publicity. Which is a bit odd in itself, because surely there would be some legalities around this? Like, if the authorities found out her name, would a death certificate have to be created? Like, there never was one, but surely there has to be. I did try to Google this, but it's a very specific question that I just couldn't find an answer to. And then six years later, so the late 80s now, somebody left a note on Little Mrs. Gravestone that read, Sarah Graham is her name, 6th of July 1936, date of birth, 6 years, twin. Other notes on other gravestones said that her twin Michael and other relatives, so her mother, stepfather and stepgrandmother, were all buried nearby. Now investigators went in assuming that this was a hoax, but this was the first time they'd ever had any potential name mentioned, so they looked into it anyway. They checked police files and state records, finding no Sarah or Michael Graham born on that date in Connecticut. Of course, it could have been that the family came from Massachusetts or another local state for the day, or they were transients from distant places. But if that was the case, why would the note say that all of her relatives had been buried so nearby? It just didn't make any sense, and investigators have never found any proof that Sarah Graham ever existed. 
In 1991, an arson investigator called Rich Davey published a book called A Matter of Degree, The Hartford Circus Fire, A Mystery of Little Miss 1565, in which he claimed that the girl's identity was Eleanor Emily Cook from Massachusetts. And this theory has since been widely accepted to be correct. Eleanor had been born in March 1936, making her eight years old at the time of the fire, and she had attended the circus that day with her mother Mildred and brothers Donald, nine, and Edward, six. Mildred and Donald survived the fire, whilst Edward died the next day. Eleanor was missing, and it is assumed that she died in the fire. Family members tried to find her body, but they never did. Mildred, her mother, was so traumatised by the fire and by losing two children that she was never in a well enough mental state to pursue the search for the body herself. She just completely fell apart. Now, Eleanor was certainly a young girl who attended the circus that day and her body was never identified. It is assumed she died there. But the question is whether or not she's Little Miss 1565. But their descriptions don't quite match. Eleanor's aunt Emily described her as eight years old, tall for her age, about four foot four, with light brown hair, blue eyes, and she was wearing a red and blue plaid play suit with red socks and white summer shoes on the day she visited the circus. Emily also said that Eleanor had eight permanent adult teeth. In the days following the fire, Emily viewed the body of Little Miss multiple times and concluded that it was not her niece, along with Emily's uncle Ted, who also confirmed it was not her. Even her mother Mildred, when shown a photo, said that it wasn't her. However, it is said that exposure to extreme heat and smoke can actually change a body's outer appearance, let alone death in itself causing people to look different. A sort of lack of animation will change how anyone looks to onlookers, so people have never been sure if they were right or not. Connecticut State Police had their forensic lab compare hair from Eleanor's hairbrush with hair from Little Miss 1565, and they said it was a match. The hair very well may have been from the same person. But here is the confusion. Little Miss 1565 was said to be blonde, Eleanor had light brown hair. Eleanor was also said to be significantly taller, with more adult teeth, and she was wearing an entirely different outfit. Little Miss was wearing a white dress. Regardless, in 1991, it was confirmed that Little Miss 1565 was indeed Eleanor. The body was exhumed and reburied at Centre Cemetery in Southampton, next to her brother Edward. From day one, a lot of people have questioned this identification, but as far as authorities are concerned, she's Eleanor. They've said she is Eleanor. Even Eleanor's mother Mildred maintained right up until her death in 1997 that this girl was not her daughter. There were actually the bodies of two other children who had been burned beyond recognition and remain unidentified, so it's thought that Eleanor was actually likely one of those and not Little Miss. Now obviously the best way to solve this mystery today is through DNA testing, but the logistics of this is quite complicated. It involves the exhumation of not only Little Miss 1565 slash Eleanor, but also family members of hers to compare DNA to, and then the exhumation of the other identified people as well. Is it enough to just know that Eleanor died in the fire and there's a body in her grave, even if it's not truly her? I don't think so, but apparently the authorities do. I think the young girl, if it's not Eleanor, does deserve to be identified properly. But as far as the authorities are concerned, this is a closed case. She's been identified, so it's an uphill battle. But like I said, Little Miss 1565 isn't the only unidentified victim of this fire. The wonderful, wonderful DNA Doe Project are currently working on the identifications of two other female victims. They were both exhumed in October 2019. It's thought that one of the women was black and the other was white. The white woman actually did have a suspected identity in the form of Grace Dorothy Fifield, who was known to be at the circus that day, but her body was never identified and she is still listed as missing. She attended that day with her two children, twins Ivan and Barbara, who did manage to survive. And it's thought that her remains were originally misidentified and released to the wrong next of kin, but she could also be one of the unidentified victims. However, conventional DNA identification methods were unable to match the body's DNA to that of Grace's living granddaughter, Sandra. Therefore, the Chief State Medical Examiner requested the assistance of the DNA Doe Project in not only the case of maybe Grace, but the unidentified black woman as well. 
However, the status of this case on the DNA Day Project website is on indefinite hold. This is a really tricky case because the DNA here is highly degraded. These bodies were burned and buried for over 75 years. In January 2020, the bones of both victims were sent to Astria Forensics in California, who specialise in ancient DNA analysis. However, after attempting multiple extractions on each victim, insufficient DNA was obtained to go to the next step, which would have been sequencing. The website states that given the condition of the remaining samples, instead of just keep making these futile attempts, they've decided it's better to preserve them until further advances in extraction techniques become available hence the indefinite hold. They've not given up, they're just waiting for better technology that I have no doubt will come along sooner rather than later. The samples have since been returned to the custody of the medical examiner and they will try again. The DNA Doe Project never gives up on a case, this isn't the first time something like this has happened and they have eventually managed to get an identity so it is just a case of waiting it out, waiting out the technology. Today there are still six unidentified people from this tragedy as well as what is classed as unknown parts where it's not known if they're a victim in themselves or just parts of another victim which is a horrible concept to think about. As well as Little Miss 1565 who we've obviously spoken at length about, there's 1503, a female child of approximately 9 years old, probably white, 3 foot 11, 55 pounds, having been described as a slender build with light brown hair with a red glow. She was badly burned and her hands and feet are missing. The dental examination showed that her upper and lower permanent adult molars were present, but the rest were all her baby molars, with fillings in four of them. Unidentified 1510 was a male aged about 11 years old, probably white, 4 foot 4 and 70 pounds with a muscular build. He was wearing white ribbed shorts and an undershirt with shoulder straps. Again, he was badly burned with his feet and hands burned off. He only had three baby teeth left and had four fillings. 2109 was a white woman who at this time was thought to be aged 30 plus, 5 foot 1 to 5 foot 5 and about 148 pounds. She was small bowed and stocky with light brown and blonde hair. She had wide hips, a large bust and small hands and wrists. She was found to have a scar on her abdomen that was about 8 years old. She was wearing pink trousers, a heavy lace Spencer corset and tan rayon socks. She had gold crowns on two teeth and gold fillings in two as well. Now this was one of the bodies exhumed in 2019 thought to be Grace Fifield, but at this time experts provided a slightly different description of her. They said she was between 20 to 50 years old and 5 foot 4. Victim 4512 is the other woman who was exhumed back in 2019. She was described at the time as being possibly black or questionably white. It was very hard to tell as no portion of the skin showed its natural colour. She was 30 to 35 years old, 5 foot 2 to 5 foot 5 and between 140 to 160 pounds. She was short and stocky with wide hips. She wore an ornamental ring with missing stones on her right ring finger, a sterling silver slave bracelet with crossed R's and an eagle on her left wrist, and an 18 carat white gold wedding band on her left ring finger. I was very curious as to what a slave bracelet was, so I gave it a Google and found this flyer that describes it as fashion's latest ornament which smartly dressed women are adopting everywhere. It seems like they're fashioned from the identification bracelets that enslaved people were forced to wear, which is shocking to me, but our Jane Doe was wearing one and it could be an important part of her identification. Her dental examination showed large and strong teeth, the upper of which sloped forward. Victim 2200 was a male aged 55 to 60, probably white. He was 5 foot 3, so noticeably short for a man, I say that only to help with identification, and about 170 pounds. Again, his feet and hands were burned off, his left arm was missing from below the elbow. He had previously fractured his mandible and had extensive gold work and bridges in terms of dental care. That's all the victims who remain unidentified to this day, but I'm sure with advances in technology, they will all be eventually reunited with their names. But that's not the only mystery we have to contend with in today's episode. There's also the long-standing mystery of who started the fire and why did it start? It may well have been an accident, but what if it wasn't?
In the days immediately following the fire, the Hartford County Coroner interviewed 50 witnesses and he came to a very similar conclusion as the fire marshal, that the fire had started at the back of the blue bleachers in the southwest end of the tent and from there caught onto the side wall. He also agreed that the evidence seemed to show that the fire was caused by somebody throwing a burning cigarette onto the folds of the sidewall canvas or onto the ground. However, many people suspected an arsonist might be responsible. In 1950, six years after the fire, a man called Robert Dale Seagy was arrested for starting a number of different fires in Ohio, telling investigators that he saw a demonic apparition called the Red Man who ordered him to start them. Under intense questioning, he ended up confessing starting the Hartford Circus Fire as well. Now at the time of the Hartford Circus Fire, he was just 15, 16 years old, and he was working in the lighting department of the circus, although he wasn't actually on shift for the matinee performance that day. According to investigators, he told them that on the afternoon of the fire, his mind went blank, and the next thing he remembers, the big top was a light. However, immediately Hartford investigators had doubts about his confession, as it's thought that he made it whilst under intense investigation and probably duress. Seagy was also known to be mentally ill, and whilst he was actually charged with the fires in Ohio and was handed down a lengthy prison sentence for them, there's no actual proof to suggest the circus fire was caused by anything other than a mindless accident. Within just a few months of making the confession, Seagy actually recanted his statement and the Connecticut authorities never actually formally interviewed him. He died in 1997, but a couple of years before this, he actually did an interview in which he still denied setting the fire. He said in this interview, Christ's sake, I was only 13 years old back in 44, and that was a hot goddamn day in July 6th of 44, and nobody would believe me that I was downtown in Hartford watching the movie Four Feathers when that damn circus burnt down. But there are a couple of problems with the statement. He was actually older than 13, and Four Feathers had been released five years beforehand. No cinema in Hartford was showing it at the time of the fire. But you could put that confusion down to simply the passage of time. 50 years had passed and CG was ageing. I'm sure memories get confused over 50 years, even for big events like this. Whilst a lot of investigators and historians do still suspect arson as a possible cause for the fire, not many believe it was CG. But why do they think arson? Many people don't think that a discarded cigarette could have actually done this. The side walls of the tent were actually covered with burn marks where people had thrown cigarettes or stubbed them out on the side walls over the years. If the canvas really was that flammable, how come it had never happened to that extent before? Or maybe it was just always a matter of time. Over the years, extensive testing has been done to prove or disprove the cigarette theory. In 1967, an experiment was done where they matched the conditions of that day exactly, and they came to an interesting conclusion. They found that dried grass, as it would have been in the tent that day, is incredibly difficult to ignite with a cigarette, and therefore this could be inconsistent with the Hartford fire. However, if there were flammable substances nearby, this would have been an entirely different case. They said there had to be another factor. This wasn't just cigarettes and grass or cigarettes and canvas. Something flammable was nearby, but no investigation ever revealed anything like that. Though in 1993, there was a complete re-examination of the fire. All the available information was re-examined and re-reviewed, and that's basically the conclusion they came to. It reads, A carelessly discarded cigarette thrown into the dry grass would not alone have started this fire, but other accidental ignition sources could not be eliminated. The re-examination did not reveal any indication this was an intentionally set fire. Case closed. And that's it. The early investigation thinks that the fire could have started in the men's room, others testify that it started behind the bleachers. The 1993 reinvestigation suggested the former. And I'm not claiming to be any sort of expert, but to me, the men's room does make more sense to me. There's every chance that a discarded piece of toilet roll on the floor, or even some sawdust to keep the floor dry, would have much more easily ignited than some dry grass or just the canvas. A cigarette itself is not going to set the canvas on fire, test after test has proven that, so there must have been something else there, but obviously it would have burned away, we don't know. On July 7th, 1944, just the day after the fire, 
Five officials were arrested at the circus grounds. The vice president of the circus, the general manager, the circus executive, the chief electrician and the chief wagon man. All of them were charged with involuntary manslaughter and in February 1945 they were heavily sentenced. The general manager and circus executive were sentenced to seven years imprisonment each, the vice president got one to five years and the others six months to a year. The circus company as a whole was also fined $10,000, so some people were held accountable here, which is a lot more than we can say about a lot of other historical disasters very similar to this one. But really, the failures here were something that went a lot deeper. Events like this, like the circus, should have been subject to much more thorough health and safety regulations. But as we've covered so many times in this channel, the reason we have such regulations today is because things like this happened. A lot of rules and regulations seem like common sense now, but only because history has shown us what happened if you don't abide by them. After the disaster, the circus quickly reached an agreement with Hartford officials that they were going to accept full financial responsibility for what happened, I mean they couldn't do anything else, and they would pay whatever amount the city requested in damages. In total, they paid almost $5 million to 600 victims and their families over the next 10 years. You would think this might bankrupt them, but this was a big company and any profits they made for the next decade had to be put aside to pay off these legal claims. They didn't make any money for a very long time afterwards. Today, a Hartford Circus Fire Memorial stands at the site of the fire at 250 Barber Street in Hartford. It was dedicated on July 6, 2005, so 61 years after the fire happened, which seems like way too long to get a memorial like this in place, but hey, at least it's there now. It features several bronze plaques following the timeline of the fire and at the centre sits a circular plaque commemorating where the centre of the big ring would have been. It really is a lovely looking memorial. There's also another one at Northwood Cemetery where the still unidentified victims remain buried. This is a tragic piece of history that I'd never heard of until recently and I know it's a story that's going to stick with me for the rest of my life. I am terrified of fires, it's one of my biggest fears, and I can't even begin to imagine not only the fear of the people who sadly died, but also the trauma that the survivors have had to deal with for the rest of their lives. I have full faith that the unidentified victims will one day get their identities back, but I don't know if we'll ever find out who started the fire. I mean, if it was accidental, we definitely won't do. I do wonder if there's somebody out there who knew he maybe discarded a cigarette in the men's toilets or off the back of the bleachers just moments before the fire began. I wonder if they knew what they'd done. How would you begin to make peace with that, even if it is an accident? Thank you so much for tuning in today, and I'll see you in the next one. Bye, guys.